Okay, dear students, we are in the home stretch. Okay, he got a couple more presentations. I know, I know, this is a lot of material, but it's important because stocks are sexy, stocks are exciting, stocks are risky. <laughs> yeah. So, in this presentation, we will look at the different types of common stocks and uh, finally try to get our our, our arms around the idea of growth versus value, growth versus value. And then we'll finish with a discussion of what is called market capitalization. Okay? So let's get started on slide 75. These types of common stocks are very general, and I basically took most of this, folks, from a book called One Up on Wall Street by Peter Lynch. There's a little bibliography on the website uh, and in Canvas that says, you know what, these are really good books for you to read. And they are. Uh, spe specifically, the uh, One Up on Wall Street is a great book to start with. Another good book to start with is A Random Walk Down Wall Street. And eventually you're going to want to read The Intelligent Investor. So check out the commentary, check out the bibliography. Don't read that one first, okay? But we'll re refer to that one often. In fact, in this presentation. So let's get started on slide 75. Blue chip stocks. These are the financially strong, high quality stocks with long and stable records of earnings and dividends. Peter Lynch calls them the stalwarts. You know who these are. The brand names that everybody can rattle off. They are often referred to as value stocks. Yeah, stick with us here. Uh, they attract conservative investors. And not, we're not talking about politics, folks. We're talking about people who want to invest in stocks, yes, and know that it's risky, but they want stocks that f exhibit far less risk than uh, more speculative, uh, smaller, or just, just more spec speculative, which we'll get to in a few slides here, stocks. Examples, General Electric, General Motors. Oh, no, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, these two companies for decades were the bluest of the blue. Are they still? Well, yes, yes, but General Motors is not the same company it was several years ago, and GE certainly is not the same company it was several years ago, but not like what happened to General Motors, as we'll see. But, um, but... Yes, they're still big companies, and uh, this is the reality these days. It used to be that there were companies that just, you you never worried about their future, but not anymore. The world is changing so fast that uh, that even stalwarts, even the blue chips, and where does the name blue chip, even the blue chips can, can fall? Uh, you ever hear of Kodak? <laughs> Some of you have heard of Kodak. It used to be ubiquitous. You like that word, ubiquitous? Everywhere. Those little yellow boxes of film that nobody uses anymore. Um, you, 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 where did the term blue chip come from? Well, it actually comes from gambling, believe it or not. Because over 100 years ago, 150 or more years ago, only gentlemen owned stock. Women weren't even allowed um, to own stock. Uh, gentlemen... Uh, owned stock and gentlemen gambled. It's what a gentleman did. And the blue chips were the most expensive stocks. <laughs> we don't like gambling in our in our in stock investing, but some do. And then the second group are income stocks. These are stocks with long and sustained records of paying higher than average dividend. They could be blue chips. They don't have to be. And they also all, also often are referred to as value stocks. What are income stocks? Well, they are normally slow growth companies in mature industries. And the two tremendous examples are utilities and banks. Well, utilities never lost their income stock status, but banks started to get real scary after 1999, when they lifted all the, uh, the 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 constraints that were on our banks, and then in the, what do you have, we saw what happened in the 2000s. They, yeah, yeah, right. They crashed, and we had to bail them out. Mm -hmm. And on my on my uh, my um, homepage is a link to uh, a, a gentleman 
who's very, very sharp. Uh, it, uh, you got to check it out. Um, the banksters and and how and what happens when the banks holds the hold the uh, economy hostage. Check that out. Uh, banks are becoming boring again. It's taking a while, but they're becoming boring income stocks again. We can rely on these for 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 um, regular and steady dividends. Uh, they don't grow that fast. Yeah, these income stocks. Now the next category, slide 76, are growth stocks. These are stocks that experience high rates of growth in operations and earnings. The growth rate typically 15 to 20 percent. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it is 20 percent growth. You're 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 twice as big in three years. Often no dividends all, at all. Why? Because they're 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 reinvesting that money back in the company. Maybe they pay a small dividend, maybe not. The stock should go up, but folks, it's going to be very volatile, which is a fancy word for, ah, it fell, it fell. Now, what are the examples here? Intel, Microsoft, Hewlett Packard. Wait a minute. Are Intel, Microsoft, and Hewlett Packard still growth stocks? Well, you know, I, my understanding is Intel and Microsoft are still growing, but HP is split into two, and who knows what's going on with them. But it turns out that their the original core business of printing is actually doing pretty well. <laughs> um, yes, but not like they used to be, folks. 20 years ago, uh, 25 years ago, when everybody was buying their first PC and and, and uh, learning about this new technology called the Infernal Net, yeah, they were tremendous growth stocks. Uh, that's not to say that they're not going to continue to grow in the future. Uh, Intel is still holding its own, and Microsoft is supposedly doing very well with its cloud-based services. I wouldn't touch them with a 39-and-a-half-foot pole, but I'm showing my bias against uh, Microsoft now. Uh, I just wonder why people still use their software after being kicked so many times and spit on, and they still use their software. It always amazes me. Um, so, uh, so no, who are the growth stocks now? Right. The Internet-based uh, companies like Netflix and Amazon and Facebook and Titter. Right. Tesla. Who else? Who else? Uh they call them the fangs, Google, right? Apple, of course. And so these are the, uh, the sexy growth stocks. Now, slide 77, folks. Here's where we finally try to get our arms around this idea of growth versus value. As we said way back in Chapter 4, you have to be careful when you use that term value because the investment company, the investment world, I'm sorry, the investment world, loves to throw around the terms growth and value. But the meanings are, of the terms are not exact. It depends on who you're talking about, talking to, because people will use the terms differently. Typically, investors often use the term growth to designate a high P.E. stock, while they use the, the term value to designate a low P.E. stock. Now, you remember price-to-earnings ratio? The higher the price to earnings ratio, the more excuse me, the more the um, investor investment world believes the future for that company is bright and exciting, and they're looking for it to grow their earnings and become worth more. A company with a low PE, well, the investment world isn't really that excited about that company. Now it doesn't mean they're right. You know, come back in three to five years and we'll see what's What's the case? But but no, it, that's to me that's not what the word value means. The word value to me doesn't mean it's got, it's got a low PE. No, to me it means there's something worthwhile there. There's something attractive, even if it has a high PE or has a low PE. There's something that I, as an investor, am interested in, and a high PE stock might be a great value. Whereas a low PE stock might not be a great value. So be careful. And here's an unbelievably phenomenal example. In January of 2005, Google was selling for around $200 with a sky high PE. I think it was 70 or 80 or something up there. And you have to go back to 2004. Google went public in August of 2004 at around $85. 
and went up to 200 quickly. And the P.E. just was, woo, that's a high P.E. The old GM, and remember, GM went through bankruptcy and disappeared in 2008-9 as a stock, <laughs> was selling for $34 with a very low P.E. I think it was 5 or 6 and a, and a huge dividend. It was paying very good. Even though they weren't making that much money, they were still paying a huge dividend. And so you'd think, you know, Google's the growth stock, GM's the value stock. Well, what happened, right? Now Google sells for about $2,100. Now that's a split adjusted in, uh, in amount. If you go look it up, it actually is half that. You'll say, oh, okay, because that's because it's it, it split, right? With, with a much lower PE. The, low, the PE is not in the, in the 70 or 80 nosebleed section. It's still pretty high. And the old GM stock, the old company, is gone. They renamed the shares Motors Liquidation. <laughs> First they called it Liquidation Motors, and I guess people got upset with that because instead of General Motors, it was Liquidation Motors. So they changed the name to Motors Liquidation. And that stock still still sold even after G, GM fell into bankruptcy. Even though the company was gone, the, 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 the stock was worthless, it still traded until March of 2011 when it last traded for four cents. And now if you own that stock, it's worthless. You can't even sell it. Nobody wants it from you. So so which one was the better value? Hmm? <laughs> so be careful when you hear people throw around those terms growth and value. You need to pin them down about whether they are talking about just a low P.E. stock or they're talking about something that has worth to it, that it's exciting and it's something that is attractive to you, even if it has a high P.E it still might be a good value. Okay? So now, let's take a look at slide 78 and look at speculative stocks. Now, these are typically growth stocks, but not necessarily. These are companies with a very high degree of risk. They are losing money or have very low earnings relative to their valuation. <coughs> they will offer the possibility of substantial capital gains. But, dear students, they also offer the possibility, often more likely, of substantial capital losses. And who are these stocks? Alternative fuels, marijuana, biotechnology, internet, the new technology! You see, in the late 1990s, some of these internet-based companies were, n were not going to make any money for years. They were losing money, and the more money they lost, the more their stock went up. Figure that one out. And people thought, well, it's the future. Well, guess what? The future can't come fast enough for some, couldn't come fast enough for some of these companies, and they're all gone. So anybody, anybody out there want to buy Tesla stock? Folks, Tesla is an amazing company. What they've done, it's just insane what they've done in just the last 10, 12 years. But they ain't making any money. They're losing money. They're losing money faster than they can imagine. And even though there are 400,000 people who have signed up for their Model 3, they've only delivered about three or 4,000 of them or so. So... Before you go out and buy Tesla, and I'm not dissing Tesla, folks. I think I am so I am rooting for them. I'm not going to buy their stock, but I'm I'm excited about what they've done. Before you go out there, go take a look at the history of GoBroke. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, GoPro, GoPro. Here was another speculative stock that people bid the price up uh, dramatically. They had one product. No, they they have a few more, but they basically they had cameras, right? They had, they had cameras that you put on your helmet or you take diving with you and I had, had a student who kept telling me how wonderful they were and I kept saying well, well wait a minute you know cameras digital cameras lots of people have them where's Nike you know where's a not Nike I'm sorry Nikon where's it where's a where's a, a, a Canon where's Apple and Samsung and it turns out that the market for those things just wasn't that big and the stock plummeted so be careful and this gives us Yet another time, <laughs> yet another opportunity to uh, go back and quote from Mr. Benjamin Graham, who wrote The Intelligent Investor, 
An investment operation is one which, upon thorough analysis, promises safety of principle and a satisfactory return. Operations not meeting these requirements are speculative. <laughs> and as, again, I'm going to say I'm rooting for Tesla. They, in fact, Mr. Musk, who is a, you know an amazing individual, what he's done with SpaceX alone. I mean, nobody believed 10, 12 years ago that they'd be able to ever reland land a um, a, a rocket <laughs> and then reuse it. And he's done it several times. He said several years ago that he doesn't care if Tesla succeeds or not. He is more interested in seeing the world change to electric cars. And so far, that part of his his mission, he's succeeded. Now all the major car companies are scrambling over themselves to make exciting, fun to drive electric cars. And folks, before you diss electric cars, there's no oil, there's no radiator, there's no power. You know, the, the fluids are gone. You know, it's it's there's fewer moving parts. The engines will last. I'm sorry, the motors will last for years, providing you don't know, burn them out. They'll, they'll outlive you. They're basically the same technology that, that uh, powers an elevator. And um, pretty amazing, pretty, pretty amazing. So check, check Tesla out. But, but that's if, you, if you're a speculative kind of person, then go buy it. If not, stay away from it because the parachutes had better be very large if they don't deliver all those Model 3s that, are, that, are, um, that are on order. Slide 79. Cyclical stocks. Cyclical stocks? You mean they're round? No, 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 no. Cyclical stocks are companies whose earnings and overall market performance are closely linked to the general state of the economy. They follow the business cycle of advances and declines. And the poster child for cyclical stocks are automobiles. Yes, the poster children. But also timber, steel, and any company that makes stuff because as the economy ramps up and people are getting better jobs and 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 they're getting a, a, a raises and what do they want they want a new car <laughs> oh yeah what's wrong with your car oh, nothing but, but but i want a new car I like that new car smell it's, it's good for your lungs uh yeah, and then what happens if uh, there's a recession and people are losing their jobs or at least they're not getting raises? Do they go out and buy a new car? Oh, no. So you look at the car companies and it's like a roller coaster. It's a cycle. They make tons of money when the econ economy improves and grows and they lose tons of money when the economy falters. And that's why back in 2006 and 5 and 6, I kept looking at GM saying, it's going down. They're going down. The next recession, they're not going to be able to survive. Now, I wasn't, I wasn't wishing that on them, but I was really scared. And I kept telling myself, go ahead, short, I'm short. I'm like, no, you don't want anybody to, to be, you want everyone to be successful. I mean, everybody can't, but, but you want to root for everyone. And I just remember Peter Lynch saying, don't short. And I, I'm apologize if I'm getting in um, using, remember, we talked about shorting very briefly. In other words, you want the company to fail. That's what, that's what shorting is. So, so think about companies that make stuff that, that is used in the building of new uh, products. And those are the cyclical companies. Uh, and now technology companies, right? Everything you buy has got a chip in it. So Intel and AMD and the other chip makers have become cyclical companies. <laughs> They've be gotten to the point where where the new new you know new stuff is coming out and and the uh, the economy expands, more stuff is bought, and so we got we have more chips. <laughs> Now, the other side of the coin here are defensive stocks. These are companies that tend to hold their own or even do well when the economy starts to falter. They remain stable during declines in the market. Now, they don't necessarily do well when the market's zooming ahead and the, and the economy is zooming ahead. They're often associated, but not always, with income stocks. And what are examples of this? Food companies. Uh, consumer products, Kellogg's. Do you, do you eat more Cheerios or cornflakes because the economy is doing better? Do you eat few, fewer Cheerios or cornflakes because the economy is doing worse? No, you eat your food because you got to have food. And you use uh, diapers and you use uh, soap and, and toothpaste and, and shave, shaving cream. 
And two, yeah, because you need it, right? Also, drug companies tend to be defensive stocks, but they have their own cycles uh, with regard to, to new uh, drugs and the like. But do you take more insulin because the economy's doing better? <laughs> no, you, you take your insulin because your doctor told you to take your insulin. And if the economy does badly, you still take your insulin. And it's, it's a bit of a, a, um, a, a truism. It doesn't always happen. But when the stocks fall, when, when the economy falters and stocks fall, defensive stocks sometimes actually do better. Why? Because traders, speculators, will, will rotate into the defensive sector. They still want to be in stocks, but they believe that the defensive stocks are going to actually do better than the other companies because the economy is faltering. Okay, now, the next three are sort of on the edges um, that we should be able to identify them, but they're, they're, not the eight, they're not the typical stock that we will deal with. And we're talking about turnaround stocks here, turnarounds. I, I don't like the word turnaround because most turnarounds don't do it. I call them goners. But, uh, but no, some of them do turn around. These are companies that have fallen on hard times. And what you have to ask yourself as a, as a potential investor is, can this company rebound? Can it come back? You'll hear people have, say, it has to come back. It has to. Oh, yeah, no, it doesn't. <laughs> the history is filled with companies that were once at the top of their game and are now gone. But most people, most certainly younger people, don't remember a time in the early 1980s when Chrysler almost disappeared. I mean, their cars were really bad in the 1970s. They weren't the only ones, but they were pretty darn bad. And Chrysler almost disappeared. And this is a, a great opportunity for you business-related folks, you folks who are inter interested in getting a career in business. Check out Lee Iacocca. Lee Iacocca, uh, he's the gentleman who was responsible for the Ford Mustang back in the 1960s. And he took over Chrysler, and he was the one who first did it. He worked for a dollar a year. That He actually made a whole lot of money, more money through stock options. But he worked for a dollar, and in other words, if the company doesn't, uh, come back, his stock options, his stocks are going to be worthless. And he did. They did. He wasn't the only one, but they brought the company back from extinction. And that's the same thing that's happened now with Ford, GM, and Chrysler. They are turnarounds, and they seem to have survived the storm. And you look at Ford and GM, and they're they're doing okay, you know, not, not, nothing, they're not perfect, but very few companies are. But they seem to have survived that storm of the Great Recession. I'm, I'm actually pretty, uh, they're both doing fairly well. I'm actually pretty impressed with Ford. They are trying to get into to Asia, and I think they're going to be really popular. That Ford F-150, folks, is the biggest selling vehicle in the United States, and I think eventually it's going to sell crazily well in Asia. So we'll see. You'll see. Not to be construed as a, a recommendation for your portfolio, folks. <laughs> but I'm just, I'm rooting for them. What can I say? Now, the next category are asset plays. Huh? What are these? These are companies that are sitting on an asset that could be sold or spun off. Yeah, you see the company and you think, oh, you know, it's J.C. Penney's. Well, they're a retail business. Well, you know, there's something behind that retail business. They also have an insurance division that they could easily sell if they needed money to stay afloat. Now, the whole uh, department store space, as they call it, the space, is under, is under siege. Macy's and J.C. Penney's, uh, who else? They're, they're having a hard go of it, folks, because they're getting hit, in, hit from the bottom by the, the Amazons and the Walmarts, and they're getting hit from the top by the, the specialty boutique retailers. And many of them are gone. And many, many, many of you might remember the May Company, Robinson's, uh, uh, Montgomery Wards, Mervant, uh, 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 the Broadway. They're all gone. And a lot of people are not, not too happy, not too uh, excited about the prospects for Penny's, uh, Macy's, Sears. Yeah. But J.C. Penney's has that insurance division that they could sell, and I think they used. To, I think they did sell the, uh, the the drugstore a long time ago. Who else? Who else? You see Pepsi, right? You think, oh, Pepsi. Uh, they sell Coca. They sell metal. They sell cola. They sell drinks, soft drinks. Ah, Pepsi owns Frito Lay. Yeah, amazing. And I think they still own a big chunk of 
of what's called Yum Brands. <laughs> Who are they? That's the company that makes uh, Pizza Crap, uh, Kentucky Fried Rat, and uh, and Taco Smell. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What is it? Yeah, right. <laughs> Pizza Hut, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and, uh, and Taco Bell. And so you see, you see uh, Frito. I mean, you see P Pepsi. But you have to dig deeper and realize that oh, there's a there's an asset hiding under there that we didn't see. Now these last ones, oh boy, folks, panty stocks. We really shouldn't even discuss these in polite company, folks. Uh, you ladies out there, hold your ears because this this is strong language. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, um, yeah, penny stocks. What are these? These are these are the any one of thousands of sham companies out there, folks. They're not real corporations. I mean, they are. Technically, they're a corporation. They've been incorporated. All the paperwork's done at the Secretary of State's office. But it's somebody's garage somewhere in Idaho or Iowa or one of those places that starts with a letter I. I mean, they're nothing. And they have bizarre names that don't mean anything or do mean something, but, but it really isn't a company. And we have plenty of examples on the website and in Canvas of these things, folks, don't get rooked in. Please don't believe any of the people say, oh, you can make a ton of money with penny stocks. No, you aren't going to make the money. And please do um, uh, listen to the presentations, look at the examples. It, they're scams. So stay away from them. Okay? Enough said. All right. Slide number 81. Foreign stocks, international stocks. Well, typically... These were companies that were difficult for, for, for us as investors in the United States to buy. Why? Because they were based in other countries. So if you wanted to buy them, you had to change your dollars into yen or change your dollars into pounds or, or pesos and get a, a brokerage account there in that company, in that country, I'm sorry. And it was just not easy. Um, so, so what did, big banks and trust companies and brokerage firms do. They went to to uh, Japan and bought a ton of Toyota and, and Sony stock and brought it to New York. And they went to, uh, to uh, uh, Finland and bought a ton of Nokia stock. And they went to Europe and bought a ton of uh, Unilever and brought it to New York. And they reissued that stock as what are called American Depository Receipts, ADRs. You might see GDRs, that stands for Global Depository Receipts, or you might just see DR, which stands for Depository Receipts. So in other words, now you can buy Toyota stock, you can buy Unilever or Nokia with dollars, and you don't have to worry about international um, uh brokerage accounts or changing your dollars into yen or pesos or whatever. And typically most of us would invest through global and international mutual funds because the mutual funds have the wherewithal, they have the technology. But more and more, dear students, more um, brokerage firms are offering international accounts based in the United States. So they're actually very simple to use. You have your dollars but inside the brokerage account, you can change your dollars to yen or to, to euros or to pesos and then place an order on their exchanges in Tokyo, in London, in, in Frankfurt or Mexico City and buy their shares. Cool? Now, uh, there's a problem with this. All right. It's not a problem. It's not a problem. I shouldn't say it's a problem, but it's something that you need to be aware of because what you have to ask yourself is what's going to happen with the currency because there's an, a seesaw relationship here. If the dollar gets stronger, all the things being equal, and they never are, <laughs> your investment overseas becomes worthless. It has a negative impact. The dollar goes up, your investment goes down. If the dollar goes down, all the things being equal, and they never are, your investment overseas goes up. Right. And so some people play that game. They try to anticipate what's going to happen with the currency. Over the long term, our currency has gone and been strong. It's been weak. It's been strong. It's been weak. But relatively, the dollar always is fairly strong relative to other um, currencies. Not always. And 
you have to ask yourself, will the dollar be stronger or weaker in the coming years? But that's the secondary issue. The first issue is, is it a good company to buy? And so you have to you have to realize that you're you're, you're setting your you're going to have to deal with this issue. I of um of um uh, I am <laughs> I apologize. I am of the opinion that dollar is fairly strong right now, so it's a great time to buy uh, overseas assets. Now I don't do it in an international brokerage account, folks. I use global mutual funds. I let the uh, mutual fund company worry about all the the uh, back room office accounting. I don't have to do the changing of currencies. But I, I don't know if the, the dollar is going to fall that much. Why? Because of oil. And why is that? Well, we pay for our oil in dollars. And up until about you know eight, nine years ago, we were, we were uh, importing a ton of oil. We were importing 66% of our oil. And we're not doing that anymore. So those dollars are not f flowing out of our country, and that's keeping the dollar strong. But will it stay this strong? I don't know. I don't think so. It doesn't mean I'm right. Uh, we'll come back in five years and see how the dollar fared. But that's a secondary issue. The, the first issue is, is this a good company? Is this a good global mutual fund? Because you want your, in my humble opinion, you want your mutual fund managers who are doing your, your investing on your behalf to go out and find the best company, no matter where it is. But that's my opinion. There are others who say, no, 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 stay in the United States. You buy large companies in the United States, you're investing globally, because Coca-Cola makes 80% of its money outside the United States. So you're going to hear other other viewpoints. I'm right, of course. <laughs> teasing, teasing. Slide number 82. Let's finish with a discussion of capitalization. Now, that's a fancy word, folks, capitalization. We usually just say cap, large cap, mid cap, small cap. And what does it mean? It's the value of the company. Everybody keys on the, the price of the stock. But, folks, the price of the stock is meaningless until it, you know, until it goes down to four cents or five cents. Then it's a penny stock. Stay away from it. But, but um. It's the valuation that's important. So in other words, you don't know what the company is actually worth just by knowing the stock price. You have to know how many shares are outstanding. And you compute the capitalization by taking the price of the stock times the number of shares outstanding. Now we're going to do a few calculations, folks, but really you don't have to. It's online. All you do is look it up. <laughs> right. And there are three major categories. Large cap, mid cap, small cap. And these are the papa bears, the mama bears, and the baby bears. Now, this, this, these categories change over time, and I'm using the ones that were generally considered about four or five years ago, but, but you hear more and more people say, no, large cap isn't 10 billion, it's 15. But anything considered 10 or above, 10 billion dollars of, of capitalization, We'll consider large cap in our class, even though we hear rumblings of people uh, wanting to raise that limit to 15. And then there's a subcategory called mega cap. Those are companies that are worth hundreds of billions of dollars. Exa We're not there yet. We haven't had the first trillion dollar company, but it's coming. It's coming, maybe. Who knows? <laughs> and then the, so they're the papa bears, right? Papa bears. I don't know if that Goldilocks, you know, Papa Bear, Mama Bear, Baby Bear, if that makes any sense. But the mid cap stocks. Now these are companies, some of which you've heard of, many of which you've never heard of. And we are going to use the category that was popular about a few years ago, and that's and still popular with some people, two billion to ten billion dollars. Right, medium sized companies. Now some people are saying, Oh no, four billion, no, three, four billion, up to fifteen billion. So you decide which which uh, which numbers you want to use because they're squishy. You know, it depends on who you talk to. And then small cap stocks are anything from about 100 million to 2 billion, 3 billion, 4 billion. Some people are saying, "Oh no, 4 billion is still a small company." I don't I don't buy it. But that's you know that's it changes over time. And then there's a subcategory in small caps. And those are called micro caps. Anything less than about $100 million, $70 million, $80 million, $50 million, down to $10 million, that's a micro cap company, folks. These are very, very risky companies. But 
Remember, every large cap company was originally a small company someday, right? And so that's where the growth is, and that's where the danger is. And as we said back in Chapter 1, those numbers that say that small cap stocks do better than large cap stocks over time are ignoring all the stocks that disappeared. Survivorship bias, right? And then we shouldn't, again, even discuss penny stocks in polite company. And it used to be if a stock price got down below $5, they called it a penny stock. Well, that's not really true anymore because of technology. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, as we said before, I don't know if you remember, if the stock price got down below 5 the New York Stock Exchange didn't want you anymore. They just didn't want you on their exchange. And it, I think it's still a dollar for the NASDAQ. But again, technology is sort of taken that that bogeyman away, boogeyman away from them. But once it gets down to pennies, just, just forget it. It's not a real company. Or it was a real company, and now they're a goner. <laughs> Maybe they're a turnaround. So let's take a look at an example on slide 83. The price of this company is 20 bucks. The number of shares is 5 million. So we really just, the price is irrelevant unless we know what the number of shares outstanding is. So we take $20 times 5 million shares, and we get a market capitalization of $100 million. This is a small cap stock, right? Remember, the stock price, everybody keys on the stock price, but for the most part, until you get the, you know, the penny stocks, $0.25, cents, $0.05, cents, the stock price is irrelevant. You must look at the market cap to see what the value of the company is. Remember Warren Burke? Buffett's Berkshire, Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway. They own Geico. They own uh, Dairy Queen. And uh, they own a bunch of companies. Seize Candy. And they have a ton of Coca-Cola stock. And uh, McDonald's and Procter & Gamble. He never, never split the shares. So there's a lot fewer shares of uh, Berkshire Hathaway. But they're $300,000 a share, right? <laughs> so don't get all hung up on the share price. Look at the market capitalization. And so let's take a look at a couple of examples. Here's a couple of mom and pop shops that sell uh, store stuff in Walmart and Target. No, <laughs> multinational. Well, actually, um, uh, big companies. I shouldn't use the word multinational. I'll tell you for a reason here. Uh, Walmart. Uh, on this day, February, 16th of February, uh, it ended at 104.78. Target ended at 75.70. And you might think that, you know, Target's a little smaller than Walmart. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You know that the, you're right. Target isn't even a multinational company. Country. Co co corporation. Sorry. Multi, multinational corporation. Multinational company. They tried. They tried moving into Canada. Didn't do so well. Where Walmart's all around the world now. So, what we find, what you know intuitively, that the Walmart's a lot bigger than Target, and you were right, because look how many shares are outstanding. There are almost 3 billion shares of Walmart out there, and there's a little low, oh, 500, 540 some million, 543.6 million shares of Target. So the reality is that Walmart is much bigger than Target, right? $310 billion worth of market capitalization. Versus 41 billion. Now that Target's still a big, a large cap company, folks. I mean, they're no slouches, but they're what, you know, one seventh the size, one eighth the size of Walmart. Yeah, exactly. Look at the market capitalization. And what does that mean, folks? If you wanted to buy Walmart, if you wanted to have Walmart as your own, you'd have to walk on down to the New York Stock Exchange with 310.4 billion dollars in your pocket. And buy up every share. No, it doesn't work that way. Why? Because as soon as you started buying every share, the price would start climbing and climbing, and everybody would look around. Like, Who's buying all the shares? And so now, when we have a entity that wants to buy another entity, whether it's a private consortium or one company corporation wants to buy another corporation, there is a set methodology. They 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 go to the exchange and say, "Look, we're looking to take over." Say if Walmart wanted to take over Target. Now, it's not going to happen, folks. The, for the regulators wouldn't allow it, but, but Walmart doesn't want Target. But let's say they did want to buy Target. They would go to the New York Stock Exchange and say, look, we're, we're interested in buying Target. Now, this is all hush-hush, folks, because you know, can you imagine what, what you could do with that information? Right, exactly. 
And so we're willing to offer $80 a share or $90 a share because they can't just offer seventy five seventy. They know what's going to happen, right? The, the price is going to start rising. So they make what is called a tender offer. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a stab. You know, it's, hey, you know, we'll offer $85 a share. They usually offer 10%, 20% more than the current price. And then that information is distributed in a set methodology. And anybody who knows that beforehand can't trade on that because you know what's going to happen, right? If it's a bona fide, which is that word of me again, if, it, if it's a, if it's a real offer, if these people are serious and have the wherewithal to actually pull this off, then the stock price is, boom, is going to zoom right up to that, that mount, or pretty darn close. And so that's why this is all hush-hush and in insider trading and in, in, in non-public material information. And <clears throat> if the investment community thinks, ah, they're just blowing smoke, they, they don't really, they're not really trying to, they can't really do that, then the price won't jump off jump up. If the investment community thinks, oh my goodness, somebody else might bid higher, the price will go higher than than what the tender offer is. And then you get into a bidding war. It's, it's pretty dynamic and pretty exciting if you're involved in that world. And so watch for that when you're, when companies are, are um, taken over by another entity. Uh, it could be another corporation. It could be a private consortium, a, 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 a private equity firm they're sometimes called. Uh, yeah. Sometimes it's the employees. The the management gets together and says, eh, we're not too happy about what's going on with our stock price. Uh, Cox Cable, Cox Communication, the, the, the management got together and bought the company and took it private. Yeah, pretty cool. Slide 85. AT&T and Verizon. You've heard of these two uh, little companies that sell cell phones and services. Yeah, right, <laughs> exactly. And you look at the two prices and you think, wait a minute, AT&T is smaller than Verizon? Well, I don't know. I don't know about that. Look at the number of shares outstanding. There are actually 6.14 billion shares of AT&T, 4.08 billion of Verizon. So it turns out that AT&T is a little bit bigger than, AT than Verizon. Not a whole lot bigger. 228 billion versus 205 billion. They're both mega cap companies, right? They're both huge companies. And you think anybody, and especially the young folks, you think they're going to give up their cell phones? No, no, no. It's like asking people to give up air or water. <laughs> exactly. So now, in the face-to-face -face class, we would do a couple of uh, exercises, actually four, exercises in uh, worksheet number three and take a look at market capitalization. And we'll do the calculation. It's very easy. But remember, you just look it up on the infernal net. Cool? Okay. So, I know, I know, you're tired, we're slogging through, but, but you're awesome, dear students, and we've got just one more, just one more presentation to, to, to get through, okay, in the world of the exciting and sexy and risky world of stocks. See you in our final presentation when we'll take a look at investment strategies. Hmm.